Hi, I'm Mitch Kramer, the founder and CEO of Fluent Financial, and joining me on our September 2021 webinar this afternoon is the, our portfolio manager, Mike Lanise, and we're going to uh, talk about the economic markets, what's going on in portfolios, uh, a little bit about COVID, um, and what we see happening. Uh, this will be uh, a shorter webinar than some of our others. The ones uh, we'll have in October will be longer. Um, a lot of people have brought up the questions, are we going to be discussing uh, potential uh, Biden and Democrat tax implications? And right now, all of those are proposals. And I'd hate to say something now that in you know three or four months is going to be totally inaccurate. Uh, we will have a devoted webinar to the tax impact and what that means specifically to you. So um, first thing we'll get started with, Mike does this weekly update on uh, the markets. It's you know two to three minutes long. You can subscribe to it by going to our YouTube channel and hit the subscribe button. And then you can also go over here and hit click this little bell. And once uh, you do that, then you'll be notified when Mike has posted something. Uh, we've been doing some video production work uh, this afternoon. We both realized we probably need to include plastic surgery in our budget for uh, 2022. Anyway, so um, there's some really good information there. A lot of you already go to that site. And uh, and as we tell you guys all the time, if there's something you'd like to hear more about or less about, you know, let us know. We're doing this for you guys, and we don't get a lot of negative feedback, and we'd love to hear that because we want to provide value to you at all times. So let me go ahead and get into the, the COVID piece. And believe me, I'm, I'm sick and tired of talking about this. But what I want to talk about is some good news here. Last month, we talked a little bit about that we thought by mid to late September, the Delta variant hopefully be in a rearview mirror. And as you can see here, the daily cases are starting to uh, tail off. And the death is a lagging indicator. They're tailing off as well. And if you look at Texas, basically, you have the same kind of scenario. The daily cases are starting to tail off and the deaths are tailing off as well. Um, you know, a lot of people that died here earlier in Texas than the U.S. in the, uh, last summer and then in the winter had comorbidities, had worse uh, health conditions, and obviously you can't die twice. Uh, so the Delta variant is contagious. It's not as deadly as its prior. But I think what's interesting is, and what our media just fails to cover is, what's the rest of the world doing? So if you look at India, that where the Delta variant originated, it had this big spike here in you know, April, May, and then it came down, and then the corresponding deaths kind of mirrored the, the caseload. And people say, what did India do? I mean, how many of you, you think of the India healthcare system? Did you imagine hospitals on a regular basis, uh, clean water, you know, sanitation? No, that's not the, the picture of India. So what did India do? to really not flatten the curve, literally? And the answer is, and this is one of the, uh, the provinces, Uttar Pradesh, I'm probably mispronouncing it, sorry. Um, they use ivermectin. And ivermectin, we've talked about on this many times, is starting to get a lot of traction, but that's what they, they have used. And they've used it countrywide and it's, and it's dirt cheap. And uh, the FLCCC Alliance Network, who we've talked about, they're having a hell of a time getting their message out to people because of censorship. You know, Twitter, Facebook, um, you know, these other platforms, YouTube, they have some very, very good information about treatment protocols. And, and as I've preached for many months, any, any of you on this call or loved ones who gets COVID, um, this is a, a, a kind of become the quasi gold standard. Now, obviously, we're not medical doctors. Talk to your doctor if you have a, a COVID case, but this is a really, really good case. Um, so anyway, uh, and this is also from their site. People say, well, ivermectin is not tested. You know, it, it's a horse parasite. Well, and people say, well, they need to do a random control trial, you know, RCT. This is kind of the gold standard. Well, they've done, there's 32 of them. And as you can see here, there's been an improvement in all cases. And it, it just frustrates me it, why this information is being suppressed when you have a treatment that can keep people out of the hospitals. But then I just discovered this. This is from Drugstore News. I guess there's a publication called that. Then you look at our large medical communities. You look at the AMA, American Medical Association, American Pharmacist Association, American Society of Healthcare Pharmacists. Uh, they don't recommend using ivermectin outside of clinical trials. 
you guys are smart enough to understand what's going on here. It just it just frustrates me to no end that you know you, you have people dying, people that are having uh, long stays in hospitals for reasons that are not justified. So that's all I'm going to talk about COVID. If you guys ever want to talk more about it or treatments, reach out to me independently. I'll be happy to share with you uh, what I know. So I'm going to turn this over to, to Mike and I'll talk about stuff that uh, is very interesting. Thanks, Mitch. Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in today. So um, here's your markets. This is what we have done since the pre-COVID highs. And NASDAQ is taking off there in the purple. Um, the S&P and the S&P equal weighted indices are, are both tracking each other fairly well at this point. And the Dow Jones is lagging a little bit. So um, today, some key insights that we're going to go over is, is how, how is this economy doing? How is our recovery coming along? How is the inflation picture looking? Uh, does the Fed need to remove stimulus from the marketplace? Um, or are we chugging along just fine right now and waiting to see what happens? So um, let's, let's start talking about these categorically. Okay. Thank you, Mitch. All right, so historically, September has been the worst month of the year. Mitch, um, Mitch says, always likes to say that October is the month that gets all the headlines because we've had a, a couple of crashes in October. But, but this is your, your stock market averages. And so, you know, we didn't have high hopes going into September about how the markets were gonna do, but we're still chugging along, waiting for the Santa Claus rally. Uh, let's go ahead and, and take a look at the next slide here that shows us quarter by quarter. And uh, you see in that um, there's a red column there in the center that shows our month to date. Well, there's September for you, okay? So the Dow's down a little over 3%. You have the S&P down almost 3% at 2.81. And then just for comparison purpose, you can go down and look at our V&O stock portfolio. We're down a percent and a half. Um, so so markets, markets are getting beat up a little bit, um, but um, we've seen worse, we've seen better. Hey Mike, why don't you talk a little bit about some specific stocks in our portfolios and what they've done. And, and I, no, I noticed that we made the decision to get rid of BlackRock this week. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, so our our stock portfolio is is a pretty fluent portfolio. Pardon the pun, um, but uh, one of the requests was how have our stocks personally been doing? And so you see there in the yellow is what the S and P has done year to date. Their uh, S and P is up eighteen percent, uh, which is a very strong year, um, and especially with uh, with the Delta variant happening. Um, of our of our equity portfolio, this these are sixty one percent of our our weighting right now, and that portfolio is up seventeen point seven six percent for the year. So we're just slightly trailing the the S and P index, and obviously our big winner here is Google. Um, Intuit does your tax software, um, your S and P Global. Uh, Mitch asked me to talk about BlackRock. BlackRock has, has been one of our financial sector holdings for a long time. And they recently came, came out with some statements about China that they're wanting to triple investments, recommending people triple investments in China. And if any of you have ever pulled me aside and talked to me about China, uh, China is much more uh, about form over substance. And I think you see some of these blowups happening with China, like Luck and Coffee that was faking their sales numbers. We just had a scare this week from Evergrande, which is a large um, real estate company in China. And um, this, the scare is that they weren't going to be making bond payments and that everyone was scared it was going to be a Lehman Brothers moment that was going to infect the entire, entire global markets. Um, I don't know why BlackRock's pushing China so hard right now. I'm thinking that maybe they're having some exposure to China they need to get out of. Um, so I was reading the tea leaves there and I went ahead and... Uh, and sold out of that. We, we got into Progressive and into JP Morgan. Yeah. Um, we, we, we're still in the financial sector. We yeah. just, we make tweaks every now and again. Yeah, Mike, what did our clients average in terms of returns for being in BlackRock? Uh, just over 60% um, for holding it for about three years. Okay. So Great. it was a nice return. Yeah, speaking of China, this next slide, uh, Mike mentioned about the Evergrande debt, it was spooking the markets and that's what happened on Monday. 
where we had the biggest uh, pullback since May of this year. Yeah, yeah. And if you look at that uh, that first bullet point there, um, this, the, the, the first bullet point of the bullet point, Evergrande only accounted for 3.2% of the country's property sales last year. So why in the heck is there this big Chinese scare that the market's going to be infected? I don't know. I don't know. Our final bullet point on this slide says that, that a withdrawal of capital by foreigners, um, that, that, that the domestic capital means China is not very vulnerable to a sudden withdrawal of capital by foreigners that would shock the economy into a recession. And again, I just put that, that little picture down there to show that's modern China right there. The guy hauling trash with his bicycle next to the Audi. Um, you know, if, if something crazy happens in China, I'm, I don't think we're going to be feeling it across the globe. Um, maybe from a, a production factor, but not from one of their banking institutions using Chinese currency. Yeah. In, in all our portfolios, we're underweight internationally. Um, and there's many reasons for that. The main reason why is as much as people may be frustrated with our, our government and what's what's going on now, a lot of the foreign countries have had much more severe shutdowns and lockdowns. You know, Australia has one case of COVID and they shut the whole country down. So it's, it's ridiculous. The market um, took a dip Monday and Tuesday, Mitch. We're already back up to where we were midweek last week. Um, so for our clients, I was looking around for cash and putting cash to work on Monday and Tuesday during that dip for us. Yeah, and and the timing was fortuitous because you know those of you that are in our Advantage, Vantage Plus, and Stock Income portfolios, the Monday following options expiration, which is the third Friday of each month, that's when we go in and buy positions that get called away from us, which means we had to sell them on Friday. So it created an opportunity. Now we didn't get a lot of stuff called away but we were in the fortuitous position of sitting on a bunch of cash and we were able to buy in in the low part on, on Monday, then Tuesday. And, and that's worked out well uh, for a lot of our clients. So Mike, why don't you talk a little bit about this jump we saw in um, retail sales recently? Yeah, retail sales, that number just came out. And, uh, and, and I think that second bullet point is important. Uh, the surprise improvement in sales underpinned in part by back to school shopping uh, suggests a healthy demand for goods. So I, I think that the market's been going sideways here for a little bit, minus this this dip this week. Um, but I, I do think it has some healthy underpinnings underneath it. So that's just a positive sign. Okay, great. And the, the Delta variant was doing some curbing of uh, travel and leisure. Uh, so that may be why you're seeing an increase in goods. Um, and hopefully we don't have the whole Greek alphabet in terms of variants. So I don't know if Delta will be last and I will find out. So one of the big issues uh, that is impacting our economy right now is labor. So we're going to talk a little bit about that over the next few slides. So Mike, why don't you talk about this record job um, openings? Yeah. So we have just plenty of plenty of jobs out there and, and it's, it's confounding economic experts a little bit on, on what is going on. Why are we having these jobs plentiful and unemployment where it is, and these jobs are not being snapped up? So, so if you look at that, um, let's see, is this where, um, you know, this might not be the slide where I talk about the reasons for that, Mitch. No. So, so the takeaway from this is just to see how high that job openings number is talking about 11 million job openings with 9 million people being unemployed. It's a huge gap that's happening right now. Yeah, I think one of the things that, that's happening with the employment scenario, if your income is $32,000 or less, it would it, you actually can earn more money sitting at home living off the government than going out and getting a job. Now, a lot of those benefits uh, were shut off as of the beginning of September. So we'll be anxious to kind of see how that how this plays out. Um, so, in, and this is maybe the slide you were talking about. Yeah, this, it, this is exactly where I wanted to go. And I'm sorry, folks, I, I kind of stammered on that last slide. It's this, it's this middle bullet point that I'm looking at. So, so the, uh, the chart that you're seeing below is the labor participation rate. And this is what's really scaring the Federal Reserve as far as inflation. They're not worried about CPI numbers and things. Um, I mean, that's their inflation gauge, but the real, the real scare is if, if employers are going to have to start 
dealing with wage inflation. If you have jobs out there that no one's filling and employers keep raising their wages and no one is filling those jobs, um, costs are going to keep grow, yep. going higher and higher, and that's going to push inflationary pressure on the marketplace. So they don't know what the reasons are, but they speculate here in the second bullet point, um, the expanded federal jobless aid. Now that just ended at the beginning of this month. So I, I think that these numbers that we're going to see next month are going to start to change where, where that workforce is going to start showing back up again. But I think that's a big one. Um, you obviously have the Delta variant concerns. People are concerned about going back to work. Um, if you have a two-person two working family, only one of the two spouses could go to work because you can't, you can't send uh, the kids to school and you need childcare. You also have some early retirements going on. And oh yeah, right in the middle of all this, a hurricane hit. So the biggest unemployment claims that we just recently saw came out of Louisiana. But again, we know what that effect is. That's from Hurricane Ida. Um, Arizona and Washington, Washington D.C. also posted very large unemployment increases, but you had Ohio and Texas that are economies that are opening up have big drops in their unemployment. Yeah, one, one part on the early retirement, I think it's important to mention, uh, we've had 3 million baby boomers since the start of COVID permanently retire. And a lot of it has to do with the rising housing price market, you know, the stock markets, you know, for people that didn't sell at the wrong time, they've hit their numbers and they're saying, I'm done. I don't want to deal with all this corporate bureaucracy, these mandates, um, you know, CRT, fill in the blank. And a lot of people just say, I'm done. And they've left. And unfortunately, because of this labor force participation rate, it's hard for employers to find jobs. And Mike's going to share some information with you here about the transitory impact of inflation, which is positive, but the, the big red flag we're paying close attention to is wage growth. Because if you look back historically at inflation, that's sticky. The, the, uh, the primary reason for that has always been wage growth. So, Mike, why don't you talk a little bit more detail on this next slide about this and the Fed score, uh, Reserve scorecard? Okay, so these are some of the key things the Federal Reserve looks at. So um, for those of you, just to, just to go big picture here, the Federal Reserve is, is trying not to have inflation run out of control, paying $15 for a loaf of bread type, type atmosphere, but you can't have deflation either. So they set this target for 2% for long-term inflation. And so what they are seeing here, there's, there's a couple of things, they, they're starting to see over here, your credit spreads and your inflation expectations um, pretty stable and inflation expectations can be self-fulfilling, but inflation of 2.2%, the Fed is okay with the 2.2% rate, thinking it'll come down to an average of 2%. That's their target. If you go to the second bullet point and the number two is on, on the car scorecard below, your unemployment rate is dropping. So that's, that's putting inflationary pressures uh, with more money coming into the market, more goods being purchased. Your CPI, CPI is Consumer Pricing Index. That's the main gauge the Fed likes to use to say if we are or not having inflationary pressure. And that actually dropped recently. And that could be maybe blamed on the Delta variant. That went from 5.4 to 5.3. And then your GDP, your gross domestic product, that's how, how productive we are being as a society. That is coming down as well. So are we heating up or are we cooling? We're, we're getting a little bit of mixed signals there. And so the Fed isn't sure what to do. So when you're not quite sure which direction to go, it's best to sit on your hands, I would think. Yeah. So where's the current inflation coming from, Mike? Yeah. So so this is great here. So um, you have transitory inflation, which is temporary, and that is expected to be leaving the markets here in the next few months. You also have supply chain disruptions, and those can last a few quarters. Um, people that didn't want to produce too much inventory and now all of a sudden they're having demand for their supplies and where are they? Um, I heard a story today about a, a cargo ship sitting outside in San Francisco Bay and it may be there until Christmas time because they can't unload their goods. So and then finally your core inflation and that's where Mitch and I are talking about the wage rates and you see this wage growth. And that tends to stay with us a little bit longer. So 
um, this this job gap, the job openings versus the the unemployment rate, we would definitely like to see that gap close on this next report. Uh, but that will be closely watched. And I think that's really what the Fed is going to be making decisions on. Yeah. And, and the other thing on the supply chain, people think, gosh, it's, we, we've been in COVID a year and a half and we have supply chain issues. What's going on? But uh, a lot of people forget when just-in-time inventory uh, uh, controls came, in, came into play, it was very expensive to hold inventory at all. And, the, and that works extremely well if everyone ships their goods on a timely manner. But those of you who've had to rebuild houses and those of you on the call from Texas have had to do rebuilds, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you can't get a cabinet or wood or countertop in, everything stops until you get that in because that's an important link of the chain. Um, you know, it's just a lot of people have hobbies. They can't get various goods and products. You know, car parts are, and cars are hard to get because of the chip shortage. And this is going to take a lot longer to dissipate, and that may cause uh, some inflation. But the the main thing we're worried about is the wage inflation. So we'll we'll, we'll pay a close attention to that. And if it is going to be uh, a, a bigger problem, then we will be making more adjustments uh, to portfolios to handle a more inflation environment. And the two popular places people put money in in a rising inflationary environment is emerging markets, which is down year to date, and the majority of that is China. And the other part is gold, and, and gold hasn't done that well either. So uh, we're paying close attention to it. Uh, we'll see how it plays out in the next few months. Yeah, it's tough finding places to hide, right? Yeah. So um, so going back to CPI, which is your consumer pricing index, again, the, the, the Fed's inflationary gauge, you heard all this talk about Fed tapering. So the Fed has been stimulating the economy by purchasing bonds in the open market. And that injects cash into the market and stimulates the economy. Another way they can stimulate the economy is by lowering interest rates. So you can invest at lower rates and, and grow capital expenditures. So right now, your interest rates are down at a quarter percent. So they can't lower interest rates anymore to stimulate the economy. So they've been doing their bond purchases. Well, when they stop doing those bond purchases, it starts removing stimulus from the economy. So when will the bond tapering slow down, signaling when interest rates may start rising? That's the big story behind all this. Well, if you look at this, the economy started running hot. This is our inflation index here. And you see us coming out of summer and into December when um, early November is when the the uh, vaccine started coming out and you see how hot the economy started getting there. Well, then Delta variant kicks in and you see these last two pullbacks. So the Fed that was ready to take action all of a sudden is now questioning, well, are we hot or are we not? And this is just kind of another example of what's happening with that. Yeah. So right now, I think they're still sitting on their hands. They do think they're going to start reducing bond purchases here towards the end of 2022 and looking around 2023 to possibly start raising interest rates. Yeah. And, and Mike, once you kind of tell tell everyone on the call what's going on with the price of lumber. Yeah. So lumber has been an interesting phenomenon through this. I think a, 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 I want to call it a bushel of lumber, a batch of lumber, whatever a, a, a stack of lumber was running in the 400 to $500 range pre-COVID. And then when all, all the supply chain issues hit, everyone just basically stopped production. Uh, people went home sick, the work from home. And then everyone started rushing back in, wanting to build again. And as the economy started opening, lumber prices went from around 500 up to $1,700 for a, a batch of lumber. Well, those prices have now since come down. In May, they were still around 1600. Those are back in the $600 range right now for lumber. So it's just it's just a very fast market, and you have these inflationary spikes that are really supply chain oriented. Yeah, it's it's called the bullwhip effect, and, and you know, uh, an interesting commodity where we saw that was with toilet paper. People were hoarding toilet paper at the beginning of COVID, and then as we got in the summer last year, you had tons of it. And then, you know, Delta variants and others come back, then you have shortages again. So it's, it's kind of this bullwhip effect. Um, 
in in England, uh, I understand in England, they're basically are going to stop the, the testing, um, the mask part, and they're just going to say it's going to go from a pandemic to an endemic, just like the seasonal flu. And they're only going to test people when they go to the hospital because they recognize you can't do enough masking, you can't do enough shutdowns to really halt the spread, and we're just going to have to live with it. And the treatment protocols to come out, monoclonal antibodies, and, and what this means is I think you're going to uh, uh, see a gradual increasing of the world's economy. I know there's been some great sales to go to Europe uh, for airfares. So those of you that are itching the travel, maybe a good time to book a trip uh, a fourth quarter, maybe spend the holidays in, in, in Europe. Uh, the, the last... For those of you kids and grandkids, if you have 20 extra nine packs of Charmin laying around, those do make some really incredible forts. <laughs> Mike is speaking from firsthand experience. So uh, the last slide we're, we cover with you, uh, we have eight primary portfolios at Fluent Financial, um, Advantage, Vantage Plus, and Stock Income. And, and they, we're writing cover calls on these portfolios. And this is what we tell clients that we will do is we're going to generate this level of income on a million dollars. This is the dollar equivalent. And this is the trailing 12 months, what we actually have done. And we're going to keep this slide in here every month so you can kind of take a look at it. Uh, the calls that expired in September, uh, because there wasn't a lot of volatility in August when we wrote them, we just didn't produce as much income um, for, the, for the September expiration call period. But we're still ahead of what we, we tell people what we're going to be generating for cash. And many of you on this call are, are, are living the benefits of these portfolios. So Mike, just you know, to put that in perspective real quick, Mitch. The 10-year U.S. Treasury risk-free bond is paying 1.3%. So basically, you'd be getting $13,000 annually per million dollars. And this portfolio is taking a little bit more risk than a risk-free rate. I get that. But your $13,000 is turning into $152,000. I mean, it's no guarantee going forward, but it's, it's uh, selling covered calls is a definite way to get something like an extra dividend payment for you for those with cash needs. Sure. Great. Um, <clears throat> this completes our webinar and we'll open this up for question and answers. So we'll um, unmute everybody. I'll go ahead and stop the recording.